Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for being here this afternoon. I am Patricia Tui. I'm head of the exhibition program at the National Library of Medicine, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today to the History of Medicine lecture here at the National Library of Medicine. The lecture series of the NLM's History of Medicine division promotes awareness and use of NLM and other historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the NLM to recognizing and celebrating diversity. All lectures are free and open to the public. All lectures are also live streamed and archived by NIH video casting, a public service made possible through the generous gift of the NLM from the Michael E. DeBakey Medical Foundation. And we are certainly grateful to the Michael E. DeBakey Medical Foundation for the support, which benefits so many who appreciate our lectures and the related programs of the NLM's History of Medicine Division. Now, before I introduce our speaker for today, I'd like to take a moment to let you know about our next History of Medicine lecture, which is also a part of our celebration of history and Harry Potter here at the NLM. So please join us this Thursday, June 29th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the NLM Lister Hill Auditorium, which is where we are today. Our colleague, Dr. Stephen J. Greenberg, will be speaking on Monsters in the Stacks, How Harry Potter Came to NLM. But for now, I would like to introduce Elizabeth Bland. Elizabeth is an independent artist, a former colleague of mine and member of the exhibition program here at the National Library of Medicine, and curator of the NLM exhibition, Harry Potter's World, Renaissance Science, Magic, and Medicine. Elizabeth will take questions after her presentation, and if you do have a question, I ask you to please use the microphone in front of you. You just press the button. And that will uh, make sure that Elizabeth can hear you, and also it will capture your voices for the video cast. So please help me in welcoming Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Patty mentioned, I used to work here <laughs> six years ago, and that's actually what I'm going to focus on is um, my history with Harry Potter and I'm gonna situate it within the fan talk, um, within the fan culture. If you wanna know the history stuff, go to Steve's talk, I will be there. <laughs> he is the, uh, Dr. Greenberg on Thursday, he's the expert. Um, so, my talk today is called A Look Into the Pensieve. Um, Albus Dumbledore, when first explaining the Pensieve, which is a, a non-magical, or a non-historical magical artifact. Um, many of the artifacts mentioned in Harry Potter are historical, but this one, for example, is not. Um, it is a basin or a metal bowl in which you can siphon memories, put them in, go back and look at them again. Um, Albus Dumbledore says to Harry, uh, I use the pensieve when simply siphons excess thoughts from one's mind. It becomes easier to spot patterns and understand when they are in this form. Uh, I wanted to play around with that idea and sort of look back at Harry Potter at 20 years, our project at 10 years. So let's go into the Pensieve together. Uh, 10 years ago, um, Dr. Greenberg came into the exhibition program room. I, there had been some, there's a couple different variations of the story Steve's gonna tell you as well, but I was working, that's me, with the front, and uh, I heard people talking and Steve was saying, did you know Harry Potter's real? And as you can see, everyone's attention <laughs> went to that. And Patty, who's actually not a Harry Potter fan, the one in the group, <laughs> the genius, obviously, had the brilliant idea of let's do an exhibit. It was the week that the Deathly Hallows book was about to come out. And it was basically everything that we could talk about. <laughs> we wanted to know, is Snape good or bad? Um, <laughs> um, and Steve had had a talk with younger people, middle school age kids, which is sometimes hard for rare book, the rare book group to um, connect with, and he brought out a copy of Nicholas Flamel. 
and said it's real. And I said, what? <laughs> and the next thing I knew, a week later, we had an exhibition, which the cases are now um, currently in the reading room at HMD, along with the traveling banner that we did later, not in a week. We had some more time and were able to do, um, this is the first one. We did a website, Do Mandrakes Really Scream? And we just sort of went through the collection in the books and we, we found things that were related to Harry Potter. Um, and then we made the traveling exhibition, which is currently with the books. This is the first time they've been together, the panels and the books, which is really exciting. Um, the traveling exhibitions have been to over 300 different institutions and so many of them have really embraced the spirit behind which we um, came into this exhibit. The, the just fan enthusiasm. They've any kind of way that they can link Harry Potter and an educational topic, they have found a way. So there's been potions classes at libraries. Um, people have brought in uh, to their traveling exhibitions, they brought in live animals to talk about um, naturalism. There have been um, exhibition talks that uh, have been taken at astronomy um, facilities to help introduce people to those concepts. This is a picture of the current display. If you guys go to the other building, you can see it. It's gonna be up for how long? The the to the end of the week. Um, all right, so I don't know if you noticed in the little illustration under real, I had an asterisk. I wanna explain that. By Dr. Stre Steve Greenberg saying Harry Potter is real, obviously I'm paraphrasing. He didn't really say this is, this is real. What he was saying is this is a world that has been based on historical concepts in the history of medicine and science and magic. Um, I heard real, <laughs> just went with it. Um, so since Steve's gonna do that talk, I'm gonna just let you guys go see the books, look at the exhibition panels, um, if you wanna get the history stuff. I wanna talk on the fandom. I wanna talk about the spirit that got us here at the NLM to come together and do an exhibition in a really short amount of time, which has now um, had a 10 year lifespan, um, taken on a life of its own. Um, and also the other creations, sort of the existential creations that have come from the fandom. So fandom is a newer concept that a lot of works have used um, Cornell Sandoff's um, definition, the regular emotionally involved consumption of a given popular narrative or text in the form of books, television shows, films or music, as well as popular texts in a broader sense, such as sports teams and popular icons and stars, ranging from athletes and musicians to actors. Um, so obviously Harry Potter fandom is anything related to the Harry Potter worlds, which now includes the seven books, the eight original films, the play that is the sequel, uh, Fantastic Beasts film series, which I know is gonna be, gonna have more. I think there's like up to three of those. There's the Wizarding Worlds of Harry Potter down in Orlando, in London. It's everywhere. Um, so these are just a few of the kinds of things that exist in fandoms. Uh, fan fiction, online role playing, fan videos or vidding, um, LARP, which I'll get to in a second. Um, Many of these Harry Potter fandoms are based on the content of the books. They're based on an intellectual understanding of uh, the content. Um, they're based on taking the stories and adding in what is considered um, fandom canonical as opposed to J.K. Rowling canonical, but um, plot points that are either implied or they take stories from um, relationships they wish, it's called shipping, uh, relationships shipping where they take and they make a relationship they want. For example, there are fan stories where Draco and Harry are romantically involved in, with each other, which does not happen in the books, um, but for some people that's a need that they wanna explore and they, there's like pages and pages and pages dedicated to Harry and Draco and Hermione and just entire worlds that have been built by people in their own time based on this world. Um, one of the most impressive ones is actually this wizarding world, which is newer. It is an online 
university that has forums, it has a library and it has courses, including like the history of alchemy, history of magic. You can, you can sign up. It's all online, um, so it's online role playing. But it includes, for example, you can join in the Great Hall. Anyone can come play. You can come and you make a character in the Harry Potter world. You play within the rules of that world. You get to experience as much as you can going to Hogwarts. Um, However, the online stuff is really, really great. I love it. Uh, there's so many websites. There's J.K. Rowling's website, Pottermore, which is the official one. There's the Leaky Cauldron. There's like three or four different wikis um, dedicated to Harry and all the facts in it. I thought that was a really great resource when I first started working on the exhibition. But what happened was I actually got pulled into the fan culture through this event called Azcatraz and uh, the exhibit went there and we went and gave a talk and it was hundreds and hundreds of people in San Francisco all together to celebrate Harry Potter. There were lectures, there were talks, there was an opera, there was um, just complete and total engagement from I'd never seen anything like it in my life. It was it was really amazing um, and it got me really interested in sort of how Harry Potter has gone from a book into sort of like a lived thing for many people. Um, so here I just want to define, before I go forward, LARP, live action role playing. I'll probably call it LARPing or LARP, that's the common term. Um, and that essentially means, what it means is you go and you play the role of a character within a fandom, within a world. It doesn't have to be Harry Potter. Live action role playing has existed for a while. Dungeons and Dragons has it. Um, any sort of cosplay at, at, at fan conventions, that's considered live action role playing. Um, but Harry Potter's has three different uh, role playing that I encountered at Azcatraz that I really, really um, just excited me. I, 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 I had, it was almost like seeing magic manifested for real to an extent and that people took an idea and then they engaged with it and then they made it. This is a picture from their prisoner's ball and I just want to point out um, the gender inclusiveness and the LGBT friendliness um, and also um, at this, the age, there was such a mixed group of ages. I, I had, again, I've said this before, I've not seen anything like it. Um, there were young people, old people, just really anyone from any age seems to be able to engage with Harry Potter if they want to. Um, this is a picture of a, a group of fans listening to a rock concert on a boat. Now, I said rock, but you can't hear it because, oh, that's the wrong one. I apologize. That went into the wrong order. So rock is actually uh, wizard plus rock. Rock. Um, it is an entirely separate musical genre that exists, only related to Harry Potter. Uh, it is a subset of something called filk, F-I-L-K, which is um, a misspelling from a 1970s sci-fi convention of folk talking about musicians that would get together and sing songs about their worlds usually within, with a folk instrument. Um, rock, however, is not a specific genre of music. It can be hip hop, it can be punk, it can be pop. It's only criteria is that it's related to Harry Potter. Um, all the songs are, um, they are related to some plot point. Some of them actually uh, also expand like the fan fiction does and they tell romantic stories or they tell battles that didn't actually happen. They expand on the narrative themselves. Uh, this is the first rock band, uh, Harry and the Potters. They dress in costume as Harry. Um, I'm gonna click on this and we're gonna go see a quick... Oh, you actually bought that car online yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna watch an ad, but I'm gonna skip it. <laughs> Okay, so this is a fan content, and this includes fan art, so someone took a recording and they just compiled 
anything and everything they could related to Harry Potter and Ginny Weasley. This is called Save Ginny. Your mom is like a mom to me, and your brother is like a brother to me. Can't you see things were meant? So this is from the, they're often from the perspective of one of the characters. So this is from Harry talking about Ginny getting trapped in the Chamber of Secrets and and these are these are people these are images that the fans wish they had seen many of them in Harry Potter and they're they're essentially creating um, lost moments uh, to meet their own imagination and emotional needs based on the book yeah yeah it's it's pretty fabulous <laughs> um, so the the main point of Harry and the Potters, this one is about the basilisk and saving Jenny. Uh, you can hear it sort of like a DIY sound. There there tends to be pretty like punk rock. The majority of them, just some guys and guitars, and uh, it started at a house party in uh, Cambridge in 2001. Some guys got dressed up as Harry and the Potters, and then. I'm gonna close this out. They uh, <laughs> then uh, there was more that joined. Um, this is uh, Remus and the Lupins. <laughs> Here, um, sorry. Let me go back to full screen. Apologize for all the technical errors. This is why I wish I knew magic, because then you could just think it, right? <laughs> Um, Remus and the Lupins. This is the arch nemesis of Harry and the Potters, Draco and the Malfoys. And they actually toured for a while as enemies of each other. With, they would create these songs that were kind of in battle with each other. Um, and they would travel around in the same communities to do their songs. Um, this here, they are performing at the Los Angeles Public Library. This was on the Rock Cruise, so a giant boat. And this is at a skate park. So these concerts happen any and everywhere. They, um, most of the fans are Harry Potter related, but Rock actually has people who are not Harry Potter fans that have gotten into it because of the music. Um, and then have gone to Harry Potter through the music, which is a really interesting uh, way to get to it. All right, so then, apologies, because my slides got, we're having to do this from the cloud because I had a Mac and that caused a problem. Okay, so the next, um, the next LARPing is actually Quidditch. So Quidditch is now a sport that is played by humans in the world at institutions such as Ox Oxford and Harvard and Stanford and Yale and local high schools and there is a uh, Quidditch World Cup. This is a picture from Stanford's practice Quidditch practice. Um, you can see it's mixed gender. Quidditch is actually the only collegiate level sport that specifically has language in it to include uh, non-binary uh, language towards gender and uh, trans inclusiveness. And that is an essential part of Quidditch. It's actually been an entry point for many people who'd never gotten into sports before. So it's played, um, obviously you can't fly. Um, <laughs> So they, the, the handicap that stands in for the broom is a stick, which is, looks like a shortened thing. And you have to run with it between your legs. And there is um, a keeper, which is essentially the goalie. It's the same setup. It's the same setup as in the books. So there's a keeper who's a goalie. There are um, the goals there um, that the, um, is it the chasers? Yes, the chasers, they score the hoops. Then there are beaters. There are two per team. Uh, they throw dodgeballs at you while you're running around and trying to score in the hoops. Um, and unfortunately, I was not able to get um, a picture of it, of a snitch. But uh, the snitch is a person who's wearing like a yellow costume. And they have a tennis ball and a sack tied to them. And they run around the field, the pitch just like a long distance runner, marathon running, 
just running around the whole time while the seeker tries to find them and chase them and catch them. So it's like four games at once, and <laughs> um, there's actually a movement to try to remove it from its Harry Potter beginnings to legitimize it as a new 21st century sport. Um, we will see what happens. As I said, there's an, an international Quidditch league, over 300 organizations. There's a, been a World Cup, I think, since 2009. Um, it's, it's pretty fabulous. Uh, I got to see a game, actually, when I was at, at the Azcatraz, Ask, and I, I couldn't even believe it because I don't know how you run with sticks in between the rights um, and with people throwing dodgeballs at you, and I don't know. I did not have the ability to be a snitch and just run around for like an hour. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is actually... Uh, related to the uh, Wizarding Rock movement. Um, so the hashtag DA, um, hashtag Dumbledore's Army. Since Trump was elected in November, I'm not sure if any of you have seen, but this um, hashtag DA, hashtag Dumbledore Army has been showing up alongside resistance tweets, alongside other movements, um, as a specific subset of anti-fascist protest. Um, now, this makes a lot of sense if you've read Harry Potter because it is based, it's an allegory on anti-fascism. It also promotes anti-prejudice. It's um, the author, J.K. Rowling herself, is very vocal on Twitter. Here's her supporting the inclusiveness of Harry Potter, um, if Harry Potter taught us anything, it's that no one should live in a closet because um, you know, he had to live in a cupboard when he was born. Um, she is very political. She donates a lot of money to uh, what are considered liberal progressive causes. Um, that spirit of the book has been taken up by people, um, especially after J.K. Rowling wrote that Voldemort was nowhere near as bad as Donald Trump. Um, the reaction to this tweet was really interesting because some people found it to be um, sort of um, belittling the real dangers of a fascist government um, by comparing it to a fictional villain. Um, a lot of people also have had critiques with Harry Potter being seen as a justice anthem because it's um, mostly white main protagonists, it's mostly men main protagonists, and it's mostly cisgender, which is um, the term for people who are born into the body that they identify with as opposed to transgender. Um, these are fair criticisms. I totally um, see where people are coming from. However, I really love the Voldemort Trump meme that is going around. Um, especially this one, what's under his hair? <laughs> what is he hiding under there? Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, the criticism could be fair if it was only memes. However, the history of Harry Potter has been interesting because there's actually a new self-identified Dumbledore's army in Harvard. Uh, students do, that are doing resistance training that are teaching it and they're um, attempting to get as many people together to educate them on how to be um, bystanders and in incidents, um, how to work in resistance if you're protesting, all those sorts of issues. Um, however, this is not a new concept for Harry Potter. The Harry Potter Alliance has been around since 2005 and was actually founded by Andrew Slack of Harry and the Potters and is currently executive direct, directed by um, a member of the uh, Walking Willows. And the Harry Potter um, Alliance focuses on, for right now they're focusing, they have this um, Neville Fights Back, and it's specifically learning actions that you can take right now that are direct action based that can help you feel as if you're making a difference in whatever issue it is. They focus on literacy. They um, raise money for libraries. The Harry Potter Alliance also 
ensured that Warner Brothers made that the Harry Potter chocolates were fair trade. Um, they have they raised like forty thousand dollars for Partners in Health, which is a really great organization, um, and they have chapters all over everywhere now. Um, they. They say on their website, the Harry Potter Alliance turns fans into heroes. We're changing the world by making activism accessible through the power of story. Since 2005, we've engaged millions of fans through our work for equality, human rights, and literacy. Um, they are exactly the kind of example, I think, of LARPing that makes Harry Potter so unique because unlike doing cosplay or other forms of uh, emergent, immersive experiences, they are taking it and turning it outward into action based on what they have been inspired by. Um, I, I really feel that our exhibition with Harry Potter's World fits into the same place because it was uh, made by fans. It was born of fans wanting to do something. We were just excited. There was no, uh, there was no reason to do it other than we wanted to. And Patty being a genius, which I mentioned. Um, I recognize that I might not have as much Harry Potter knowledge as other people in here. Um, because that seems to be true of a lot of the fans. When people engage, they really, really engage with it. I've done my best to be as knowledgeable as possible, so I'd like to open this up to questions. Um, if you could turn on your red light, and I will know you have a question, I will do my best to answer it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Anybody? I don't see any lights. Does anybody have a question? Does anyone want to listen to more rock music? <laughs> Here, I'll go back to the, oh, this is just me saying goodbye to you. Goodbye. I have a question. <laughs> yes. About the dangers of commercialization yes. of fandom? Yes. Speak about that, please. Yes. Um, specifically, um, by dangers, you just mean in terms of the... These fan worlds sometimes exist to make money off right, of fans. Right, right, right. So the, the, the commodification of Harry, the, pop, the popularization of it, the selling of the rights to Warner Brothers um, for the films created um, some tension, actually, with the fan community because... Um, Warner Brothers started sending legal notices to people that were what people thought was just fan art, fan videos. Um, f fan videos, because the content doesn't exist for the story they're telling, they, they're collages. They take clips of, say, an actor from another film using words, and they fit it in to the narrative that they're trying to. It's like, it's like a, sorry, it's like a quilt patchwork. Um, and Warner Brothers really went after people for using people from using uh, clips from the films without permission, like they go on YouTube and they'd say you can't use this and they take it down. And um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of anxiety when I was at Ascatraz actually about that because it was when it was really intense and fans were worried that they couldn't express themselves. They couldn't go on the forums they wanted to without getting in trouble from this big um, company that wasn't even really, to them, the owner of Harry Potter. At this point, they were the owners of Harry Potter. J.K. Rowling had written it, they had digested it, and they had taken it and made it into their own. Um, I think that because of the internet, because of the time that Harry Potter came out and the advent of the internet, the millennials being one of the first generations to really grow up with him, I think that um, the independent fan culture has not been too drastically touched by the commercialism. Um, but as I mentioned, it's a behemoth. There's more films. It's, it's original content being created for scripts, not novels now. A lot of it's outside of J.K. Rowling's hands. Um, so in 10, 15 years, Warner Brothers is essentially going to be 
their own fan creator of Harry Potter worlds because they're taking the world and the concepts and that they technically own it. However, um, I don't think the, friends, the fans agree with that, <laughs> that, that anyone owns Harry. Um, there has been a bit of a drop off with the creation of rock music because there are, there's not new content coming out. Um, there was a little bit of an uptick when Fantastic Beasts came back out because there's no new Harry Potter stories. There wasn't any new, um, new, new heroic tales for them to turn into musical poetry. There was no um, new characters to decide they wanted to fall in love with a different character. Um, so the, the fact that Harry Potter has been commercialized and is continuing to turn out, turn out new material actually kind of feeds back into the fans, so it's, it's hard for me to separate if it's good or it's bad. It is. Um, it's not. The popularity of this film, of the series, during the time that it's written, it's a contemporaneous story. We're meant to use it as an allegory for now. It's written in the 90s, set in the 90s. Um, it's modern, even though it's fantasy-based and it has um, basis in real and medieval history. Um, yeah, I think, I, I don't know where it's going to go. I think, that, I think that they'll continue to make as much money as they can off of it until people stop uh, consuming the culture, but that is not the only way to consume Harry Potter. The fandom has created its own space without anyone else involved, and that seems to be when one place shuts down, they open up a new one. Um, when one space closes down because they don't agree with like the ratings, like fanfiction.net is a really popular server for fanfiction, and there was what the Harry Potter fans called the purge, when all of these um, higher, like more adult rated, more adult themed fanfictions were just deleted from the site. So then the fans were like, you've deleted my content, and they went and they moved to another site that has agreed not to delete anything without permission. So there's, um, if you go online and you enter into these spaces, you actually see the fan canon influencing J.K. Rowling's canon now. It's a cyclical, it's, a, it's, it's such an organic situation. Um, I don't know, but not, I, it's similar to Star Wars and Star Trek. I think in terms of them also having value systems and belief systems that have been taken and put into the world, but um, I, I, I really think that Harry Potter is uh, its own, despite being very much um, a hero's journey, being very much a schoolboy's story, um, being a fantasy about witches and wizards, it, uh, it touches on something, I think, topical and contemporary. Um, and as long as those things continue to speak to people, those feelings of justice, I think we'll continue to see independent fan culture. Yes. Hi. Um, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like you to just uh, dive into the pensive one more time sure thing. and find that strand of memory as you were uh, curating sure. the traveling exhibition because um, I work at, I'm a member of the exhibition program. It was marvelous to observe you as a curator make a connection between fictional world and some things from our collection like potions and herbology which I got acquainted with by reading Harry Potter. Right. Um, as, as secondarily, it was a kind of a discovery that I never anticipated. So if you can share that a little bit of the background, that right. would be great. Right, definitely. Um, so I'll start with, I was a fan of Harry Potter. I was not a mega fan, I wasn't a super fan, I was a fan. I didn't have the most auspicious beginnings with Harry. I had been, I, I first, they came out in 99. I was in college, I graduated high school that year. I went to college and everyone was talking about it. My grandma had a copy that she picked up. My dad was reading it, my sister was reading it. My best friend was reading it and I was not going to because I was a grown up and it wasn't literature and I already had children's literature to read like C.S. Lewis or Madeline Engel. I didn't know I needed a new one, right? 
Um, enough people harassed me that I finally gave in and read it, and I was hooked immediately. Um, and by the time that The Deathly Hallows was about to come out, I had seen all the films. I uh, went to several of the midnight openings. I wasn't at all of them, but I, I would go. I was, I was a medium fan. You know, I, I didn't cosplay, but I was invested in what happened. Um, so when the excitement started to happen around Steve showing off the collection to these students, and the connection was made between the collection and Harry Potter, my mind was just absolutely blown. I just, it, it solidified for me that the world that she had created um, had a sense of realism to it and logic to it because she was pulling from existing logic and existing ideas behind magic. She wasn't creating up, she wasn't creating some new understanding. She uses Latin for a lot of things. She um, mentions um, arithmancy. She mentions alchemy. Um, these are all practices that, that were a part of the development of what we now call modern science, which I had, I had no idea. Um, I did not know that mandrakes were actual plants. I did not know that. I did not know until I looked at our uh, Horace Sanitatus book that they were drawn as, as uh, anthropomorphized figures, as people. Um, knowing that added like a totally different level to my um, appreciation of Harry Potter. Um, I would say though that it really was for me in terms of curating the experience of going to Azcatraz and going to one of the fan conferences and seeing the culture that sort of solidified this as such a great experience for me. We've had so many different kinds of people come in, people that wouldn't normally come into the rare book um, division. Juwan, who asked the question, worked with educators to develop these really great um, education modules that can be used in higher education and secondary education. I just, it, for me, it, it sort of altered the way that um, I looked at the HMD collection, to be honest. <laughs> I had been working there for a couple of years and I really just, I had come into it not as history medicine person and I did not realize the amount of resources, visual resources that artists can use in the collection. Um, I, I just, I found it could be a really, really, really rewarding experience. Um, and I don't know if I'll ever read another Harry Potter book again though, I gotta be honest. I've read it a bunch of times now. <laughs> um, so the pen sieve is actually a, I'm not really great at this print, portmanteau, portman, uh, it's, a, it's a part of her, play, it's a play on words, so it's, it's a homonym of pensive, to be thoughtful, to be thinking, and then it's also a pun on a sieve, S-C-I-S-I-E-V-E. -E. Um, and she combined the two together to sort of tell us about this magical object, which is one of the things that J.K. Rowling does, which is so great. Um, and I find it to be a really fascinating object because you're meant to look, you're meant to look back even at things that you experienced, but with, with a, a step back, a second sight. And, um, you know, when we were doing the first exhibition, it was happening so quickly. I was just like, what do we have? This is amazing. Thanks everyone at HMD, you're the best. <laughs> um, and then as we worked on it further, I got to, to know a little bit more about the books themselves and um, the history behind them. And um, yeah, like I said, it was just a really great experience. Any other questions? Yes? Hi. Um, so seeing as Harry Potter has become like a worldwide phenomenon, mm -hmm. seeing as it's like in almost every country right now, right. everyone can read it, how do you think that Harry Potter has influenced not only our generation, but multiple generations, like morally, socially, politically? How, how exactly has it changed us for the better or for the worst? Um, that's a really great question, and it, it goes back to the hashtag Dumbledore's army. I think you see with that, the first generation of Harry, 
So, so Harry Potter is really interesting for children's book because it's published, it has seven parts. When you first access the book, it's written at a different language level than later as the books progress. As Harry grows, so does Harry's inner voice, J.K. Rowling's narration of the world and Harry's understandings. Um, so it becomes more sophisticated. It deals with post-traumatic stress. It deals with um, genocide. It deals with really, really heavy issues. Um, it deals with oppressive um, school systems. Um, and there was actually a study that was recently done, and I have the notes here, that said that children who had read Harry Potter were more likely to be open to diversity and inclusion and to be kinder towards their classmates. There was a study of current elementary school kids. Um, I think I think it's two generations. So there's, there's the people who could already vote when they read it. There was the kids that grew up with it that are now out of college. There are the kids that grew up with it as it was coming out and popular. And then there's now my nephew just, for example, just got into it. He's eight. He's the new generation. So that's like five generations of people are reading this content and engaging with it. I have no idea what the impact's going to be. I, I am pretty sure that I would posit that it w could possibly be like, um, it become one of those works that we just, you know, we reference in our, like Shakespeare and our metaphors. Um, we might even get lost, like who Harry Potter is eventually in time. It may become just a standard for something else. Voldemort may be the only thing that, he who must not be named may be the only thing that lasts. I don't, I don't know what the, the final cultural artifacts are going to be, but I have no doubt that it's, it's definitely influencing people and it's, it, you cannot look at Harry Potter and separate it from the political allegory. I think J.K. Rowling made that explicit. So I, I doubt, I don't think that many readers um, can read it and engage with it and not, at least on a subconscious level, pick up on many of the messages that are in there in terms of doing the right thing against injustice, in terms of it's, it doesn't matter if you're popular, it matters if you're a good friend, um, those sorts of moralistic issues. Yeah. I, I, I uh, have not encountered a young person who has not been influenced by Harry Potter in, in, in the Philadelphia, D.C. area, like as I'm just around with people. Um, even if they haven't seen it, even if they weren't fans, it's just a common cultural language that everyone seems to share. Something like that can't help but have an impact. Any other questions? Yes? Do you have any comments on the house system? <laughs> well, as you can see from my tie, I'm Gryffindor. It's official. I went to Pottermore and did the algorithm, and it said I was a Gryffindor. I don't know what I did to do it, but I'll take it. I thought I was going to get Hufflepuff, which would have been totally fine with me. Um, some of the criticisms, actually, of Harry Potter as a social justice um, Bible are, like, the house system is problematic, right? The separating of, of people into groups, into characteristics like that. Um, I did not go to private boarding school. Um, my public school in Arkansas did not have games where we won points for things. It seems fun, seems like a good way to get kids to engage, but um, I think it's more of just her way of, of creating a simplistic archetypical uh, personality. It's just a way for her to group the wizards into different ki kinds of wizards to help better understand, because otherwise she has to introduce too many characters. Like if everyone was in the same house, then how would you know the difference between a Gryffindor and a Slytherin at like an immediate level in terms of the plot? You know what I mean? Is your question more, is, is it, do you have like a specific, do you have an issue with it? Do you have any thoughts on the house system? I'd actually never really thought that much about it. <laughs> Just general, okay. Uh, the house system is actually something that is in the uh, online world that goes along with it. Um, you join as a Slytherin and like the Slytherin, like at that wizarding, 
online world, uh, only Slytherins are allowed in the Sly Slytherin meeting room. You know, only Slytherins can talk to each other. There's, so there's, there's actually, um, if you choose to be a part of a house, it creates a community, I think, for some people. Anybody else? Yes? I remember earlier you said something about how, I think you did something about do mandrakes scream? Yes. Do they scream? They don't scream. They do not. Um, that is a uh, folklore that was um, my understanding, and I could be wrong on this. To, mandrakes are poisonous. Don't eat them. So I think the idea was it was a way to sort of like frighten people, like culturally from an anthropological perspective, it was a way to like frighten people away from eating a poisonous um, tuber. But uh, they do have like the way they're shaped and the way their root systems are, they do have like grouped joints that look like, you know, arms and legs. So, um, and then the head comes up and there's like hair. So I totally see how people, um, could use their imagination and come up with that. But unfortunately, the only screaming mandrakes are in the film. Yes? Um, also about mandrakes and yes. like a history of medicine perspective. Yes. Which I listen to like a medicine podcast. Um, like there is a mythical history of mandrakes that scream and the scream is deadly. Uh, Just like in Harry Potter. Yeah, to wear, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with, because. I as mean, the if, folk myth. If you really, it. yeah, as the folk myth. Yeah. But, doctors yes. prescribing it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, um, and in, if you listen to, I don't know if anyone's interested, it's called um, Sawbones. Oh like yeah, history, Sawbones. History it's a great podcast, podcast on medical history. And the things since Highly the yeah. Library of Medicine. I mean, the things that we used to do with medicine yeah. and treatment. Yeah. I mean, the way you were supposed to get a mandrake was send a, train a dog <laughs> to go and get it. The dog would die. Yeah. But... Because it was snipping from, it, it would eat it, and then it would die from the poison. Or from the scream. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And then, well, the dog can't tell its story, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So I don't, there's a lot of uh, actual medical history behind the biology, yeah. yes, and potions. Yeah, she, um, J.K. Rowling, um, has spoken in a couple interviews about how she went to historical collections, how she used you know, 14th, 15th century books on herbology as reference books. Um, she very, she did a lot of research in creating this world, for sure. Um, Steve's talk, Steve Greenberg's talk on Thursday, um, he's definitely the man to ask all those questions. Because um, he, he was the one that pointed it out to us in the first place. If it hadn't been for Steve, he's not here today, but I, I it's just one of those those moments in time where something happens, the next thing you know, you're doing something with Harry Potter. <laughs> like magic. Anybody else? I think we have time for another question. Yes. So this kind of adds on to my previous question. Mm -hmm. So with um, newer fans coming in and, and now growing up with like the Fantastical Beast fandom right. as well. So how do you think um, how J.K. Rowling um, kind of executed how magic works in America? Like, how, in general, how do you feel about Ubermoney, the type of magic that's performed there, the Native American roots? Right. How, how do you feel about that? Right. So I actually, I'm not, um, I have not, the American um, magical story is, new and it's it's on Pottermore. If you go to Pottermore.com, J.K. Rowling produces new content, including the history of American witchcraft and wizardry, which is what the the story behind Fantastic Beasts and um, how to find them is from the American perspective. Um, I think what you're referring to is the, the controversy re regarding the co-option of Native American myths to form a new form of magic. Yes, yeah. I have problems with that. I think um, that's in the little bit I gave about uh, legitimate problems with J.K. Rowling, um, how she has handled uh, creating American magic by taking Native American myths, by creating Native American groups 
to be a part of her magical lineage versus a historical um, lineage, I, I think is problematic. I'm not surprised because um, Europeans have a long history of um, commodifying and co-opting Native American culture differently than Americans do. Um, so I, I don't know if she, I'm not sure if she's like acknowledged it at all or tried to um, rectify it by create, you know, working with native groups or anything. My understanding is she just said, this is the story I told and this is how it is. And I'm drawing on myths just like I did the Celtics and I did the Druids, et cetera. I think it's her perspective as a writer. Um, for me, I, I find it a bit, it's harder for me to get into the new stuff than the older stuff. I don't know if that's just me being jaded because I'm like, why are you still doing this? <laughs> I thought we were done. <laughs> um, but I'm curious to see where it's gonna go because I believe that series is gonna deal with, um, directly more with the Holocaust imagery related to the first Wizarding War. So we we've meet Harry after uh, there's already been a war and they're sort of like in peacetime, but obviously he's about to come back. So we don't know a lot from the stories about that time, and it looks like she's filling in that content with these films. We'll see. I'm not sure where else she would draw American magic from. Um, uh, she's bringing in the witch, Salem witch trials. She's bringing in that um, New Salem concept into it, which makes a lot of sense, I think, for American history, but agreed, the Native American stuff is a little, a little iffy. Not really her story to tell. Anybody else? I think we got time for one more. Hi. Okay, so it's more of a comment, but it can be a question. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed that, at least when I was a child, women were always in one role. It wasn't until Hermione yeah. that it was cool to be smart. Yeah. You could choose to be smart and just happen to be pretty. Yeah. And you see it more now. Yeah. There's a lot more roles. And I see my niece gravitating to them. And now she wants to read Harry Potter. So yeah. that makes me happy. But yeah. he wouldn't have been able to do half the things he did without yeah. her and right. others to help him. And I feel like that might even have had a bigger impact on the, our the, generation than the idea some of, the other of teamwork. Stuff of the collaboration, I think you hit it exactly. I, I think that Harry Potter is the hero. He's the titular hero, right? It's his book. But it, he's, not, he's not the only one. Neville Longbottom could have been, if you are familiar with the canon, Neville Longbottom could have been Harry. He could have been in the same position. It's all a matter of chance and decisions. And, and um, if you take on that role that someone says is yours. Um, the, Hermione is such a great character. J.K. Rowling says she based Hermione off of herself and the way that she was as a student. Um, and although Emma Watson, who has been cast as Hermione in the films, is considered traditionally attractive by Western standards, in the book, Hermione is not necessarily considered beautiful by her peers. Um, and it doesn't really matter and that's really great. Now you have like Katniss Everdeen, you have um, the Divergent stories, you have a lot more female protagonists. And I do think that that's, I think that Hermione definitely um, helped usher that in. I think that the reason that Hermione, it's not Hermione Potter, is because J.K. Rowling understands the world that we live in. And uh, that's the reason that she writes as J.K. instead of Joe. Rowling is because she wanted to be known as something that could be um, gendered a man. Right. There were studies that had indicated that boys are m much less likely to pick up a book authored by a female author. So she went by J.K. Rowling in order to make the books more accessible and palatable to everyone. Um, if you asked her her opinion on if it should be Harry or Hermione, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what she would say, but I think that it was a a choice, um, and I think that the HP Alliance and um, everything I saw at the conferences, just the, the interaction between everyone, it's the community, just 
it's really, really fabulous to see people uniting over a common language and a common story, but then taking it and putting it into action here and now. All right, we might have time for one more quick question. Anybody? Are we all done? Are we Harry Pottered out? Is that possible? I heard someone. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I had a lot of fun getting to revisit um, the exhibition, um, and I had a lot of fun looking at it from a different lens, from the historical lens, but looking at it from the fandom because um, I uh, I grew up in a really rural area, and things like conventions and stuff is just not the sort of mass groups of people uniting under common interests is just not something that I necessarily, unless it was football, Razorbacks. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it was, it was a really great opportunity, and I'm really excited that the banners and the books are together. I hope you guys walk over to the other building to take a chance to look at the exhibition, to check out the, the books and the cases and the banner. Um, the online exhibition has a lot more resources. There's a higher education module that um, is essentially like a college level course if you want to jump in at that level and get some readings from history of medicine specialists, history science specialists. Um, yeah. I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you.